second session. In this session, we have only one talk. And the uh, announcement is right on the top. The mini bang and the big bang from Collider to Cosmology by Professor Pikash Sina. Please. It's indeed a great pleasure to be here <coughs> when this institute is celebrating 50 years of its existence. And I thank my good friend Radhaji, Professor Rajshekhar, and <coughs> <I'm very mean. coughs> And I promise you I won't talk for very long because it's getting kind of late. What I'll talk about is actually something I believe has not been touched upon so far, and thus the heavy ion physics at SPS to start off with, then to WIC, and now at LSC. And doing the heavy ion collision and detecting using the de detector who are involved tremendously is called ALICE. ALICE is the foreground. What you can learn about the Big Bang, if at all. This is the basic theme. As you can see in that, uh, in that picture, Arcus view. This is the colorful quarks, who are sort of product of the melting of the color symbol nucleus, if you like, once they collide with each other, and the temperature is raised to a high degree, and sometimes density also, such as neutron star. I'll keep the talk in a simple language, because I understand the audience is heterogeneous in interest, and there are many students. I don't want to be Greek. Here we see the collision point of the two nuclei in a simple way, and hopefully the temperature is high enough for a phase transition of some sort from hadrons to quarks. And you will see in a minute that the nature of the phase transition is not really known that well yet, and there's a fair amount of controversy. It is entirely possible that because the blue blue interaction is much stronger than quark gluon or quark quark interaction, there would be a successive equilibrium scenario in this regime where glue can interact and make a gluon bath, or the fermions called the quarks can do execute body in motion. This I won't talk about, we did some work some time ago. And this is the lens contracted nuclei collide with each other and in the central rapidity region the evidence is high enough to make the nuclei, again, as I say, melt and go to quarks and gluons. Then it actually expands the space and time, and then it makes a, another phase transition from quarks to a mixed phase, as it were, of some sort, hadrons and quarks. Then it cools further, go to hadron, and then freeze out. Freeze out means well, there will be no interaction whatsoever among the species, and then go to the detector. So the detector's job really is to see the integrated story or history of the space-time evolution and hopefully decipher from, the, from that particular story the beginning of this collision and find out about quark gluon plasma. I think before preempting the drama, I think the whole world agrees now the quark gluon plasma has been formed. Uh, and uh, the certain properties like flow and other things have been measured uh, quite accurately. My most important emphasis in this talk today will be our own work on thermometric signals, namely direct photons and neutral phenomenas, and the latest results that has come out from Alice uh, very recently. So then we have another artist's uh, perception a phase transition. Uh, there is the normal nuclei going from liquid to gas phase, there is a critical point. And similarly, very high density, low temperature is rare, and then going all the way to this point is a sort of a not quite clear phase transition, but a some kind of crossover, as it were. And then there's this critical point besides that, but very high density probably is first order phase transition. 
coming to my cognitive results, this is a lattice calculation of some sort, where as you can see, if you the mass of the quarks is very small or very large, then presumably it's really a first order phase transition, but the rest of the time, which is the reality, is crossover. This is a very lattice calculation. As you go on from a simple calculation, old calculation, go from hydrons to call the sudden jump of entropy, energy density, and then as I said, I'm interacting four neurons to put it very simply, it goes as T4. If you draw a curve with epsilon divided by T4, it becomes independent beyond a temperature beyond a certain critical temperature. This is now the so called first cartoon, as it as the Americans prefer to call it, and I think it's very funny to call it cartoon. As you can see, the cartoon is certainly, there's nothing funny about it, and it's getting more and more complicated as time goes by. Here you see at the very high density of the actual supernova explosion, a neutron star, and there are new things that are just coming up a color superconductor, quarconium, and so on. And this is the facility of anti ion heavy ion research. At GSI, where India is participating in a big way. And then, this is again the critical point, and crossover starts, as it were, and there is the first order of phase transition region. And as you go to NSC, you can very little dynamic chemical potential in the central region, so you are more or less meeting in some sort of way the early universe saga. But before that, I think I should remind you because. Um, Mr. So I second mentioned to give it a sort of overview type of talk rather than going into too much detail in one thing, is that there is very little known about hot dense hydraulic matter. In fact, not much work has been done. And my friend uh, Jerry Brown uh, from Stony Brook, for other is Brown and Raw Scaling Model was discovered some time ago. And it was nice to, to, to imagine that the dilatation of the mass with temperature and density would be universal. And X, X can be anything, can be neutral, can be omega, can be rho, etc. So X times is actually constant, but that does not hold, unfortunately. Which is, sorry? What is M star? What is what? M star. Alpha? M star. M is a star of the oh, effective mass. Effective mass in the medium of these species when the temperature and density is higher. In fact, the effective mass of a nucleon in a nucleus is 0.7 m, which may itself, I may argue, is a precursor of the calamity. So hot dense hydraulic matter is important to know the equation of state, the chiral properties, and the radiative properties, decay rates, and so on and so forth. So some time ago we did this work with our friend uh, Tatsu Hatsuda from Japan, and we found that these scaling law are different from each species. I will show you a curve and then go on to something else. Okay. This is the light from QGP, which is our main team as it were, and this was done quite some time ago, uh, but it's still is quite, quite interesting with the new results that have come out both from SPSRIC and uh, Alice and LSC, quark anti quark went to gamma Q, QG went to gamma QQ bar, and QQ bar annihilation processes. And to show you what experiments are doing, radiation and SAR SPS, who is in 80s as a matter of fact. Uh, this is what we built in a second, I will show you here. And this is the plastic ball of Bevelac and Barclay my friend Hans Goodbard used, and this is our sort of 80s, and we tried to find out direct photons, and a large number of bubble of work was uh, published. This is the detector that we built in uh, basically in Calcutta with our collaborators all over the country, and it's uh, 55,000 pairs plastic scintillators with optical fiber inserted diagonally to pick up uh, photons or signals of those processes as I mentioned. It's a quite a huge beast. And that was shipped to Sam and put it there in certain set of experiments called W98 towards the end of the 80s. You see, it's a mess to some extent, 
because you can see here in the cork matter the QQ bar to G gamma, as I just mentioned, but then is very strong method, with sound processes, and for hydraulic matter, huge number of channels open up. So in order to find out whether we have discovered quark going past or not, one has to take care of these channels very, very carefully. And that's not easy. And the slightest mistake of any factor of root 2 pi can create quite a havoc. So it's a lot of labor in a missing object, which is a case of heavy ion collision as opposed to E plus E minus and even PP collision. But we did take care of that. We're fairly confident it's right. And the dielectrons also are rather similar. In fact, decay of light vector mesons also go to dielectrons. And Kiku Bar, the gamma star, going to, going to dielectrons. And that has been calculated for quite some time now. Space time evolution, realistic T is a tensor. And we have to calculate that, solve that with the space time evolution. And Bokel, in the beginning, did a quite a bit of work. Equation of state being guided by lattice QCD and MIT bad hydronic resonance gas model. Let's not bother about the details. Here we see already at SPS there is a tantalizing hint of something happening. So thermal perturbative QCD is the back curve, and that of course uh, with the prompt photons, which does not fit small PT. But beyond about 1.5 GV, the two together, that is thermal and perturbative QCD, goes through data. And we notice that if you have only perturbative QCD, which is on high PT, it doesn't fit together. A thermal source of photons, then a thermalized system of quark gluons, leading out with those processes I mentioned, the light right particles benefits the data. So that is the yes. There's a great mystery about this particular data of any 60, I think. If you do not dilate matter in star or do something about the width, it doesn't go to that particular plateau. And this serious experiment, CREAS, and now we understand that even at this invariant mass, there has to be something about the dilatation of mass and the decay width. So we come to it. This is, uh, you all know now, it's three kilometers in diameter, both sides. And I think um, our detectors, oops, our group is involved in star. Where is that? Where is here? Yeah. And there is a phoenix, I think my colleagues are, Bart is involved. It's a beautiful machine, um, mostly dedicated, I would say 95% dedicated to heavy ion collision physics. And the old AGS is given to the booster to the Rick Realistic Heavy Ion Collider. So you see, to give an idea of how the people working there, uh, this is the Phoenix Bark and BHU. I'm not sure whether BHU is still there or not, but Bark is certainly there. So Bhubaneswar, Chandigarh, Jaipur, Jammu, and Calcutta. In my experience, to get all those people working together in itself is quite an experiment, apart from the experiment itself because if there are more than three or four institutions working together, they dissipate their energy mostly about agreeing to disagree with each other. This is a huge collaboration. Star, at that time the picture was taken, John Harris was a spokesperson, and just recently he was the chair of the Quark Matter meeting in Washington. It's a very large collaboration, like all these collaborations are. This is what happens if you are the chief of a collaboration, you pull the path in all directions. The reason I show that, but if you stop smiling, that's the end of the collaboration. Now we've got a sand, 9 kilometer, 27 kilometer, 27 kilometer. And this, I believe, has been touched up by many speakers, particularly uh, CMS experiments done by TIFR group that was mentioned. And I'm sure Rohini also mentioned something about it. And from now on, I will not talk about CMS or ATLAS, but mostly the results for heavy ion collision at Alice Detector, which was some of the components were built by us in India. So, this place we just saw, 
It will be a space of not many years in the seventh of the last Hadron Collider. It goes from France to Switzerland and so on. So this is the WO93, WO98 SPS, and now Alice at LSC, more of the same people, and the neural arms of the science came to visit when I was directing it. It stands out that Aligarh also came in and it developed some interesting chips and so on. This is the Alice. You see here on the right hand side of the neural arm, the second of these lot, the seven of them, is actually mostly size in metaphysics. And this is the photon multiplicity detector process by hand by VCC and his collaborators. This is the PMD models built there. And this is the neuron chambers also built in Science Institute. And this is inside the RS uh, before it was assembled together. And this is the famous model chip that we designed and fabricated at the Chandigarh foundry electronic chips. At that time, some of the big pundits in Delhi area, which were supposed to fund us, indicated that India can't never make chip of their own. And the design is impossible to be successful once you go to the foundry level. And that got most of my young students or young colleagues got hopping mad. And they did design the model chip beautifully. And that beat the Gassiplex chips of Saad area. And now it's right there at Saad working beautifully. And so beautifully is unbelievable. The resolution power, the resolving power of Manus is better than Gassiplex. You can have another look. And there was a fond hope to use this chip for medical purposes. But the doctors are not interested in curing the patient. But doctors are interested in making the patient's life more difficult so they earn no money. They are not no much taker at all. It's very unfortunate. You see, the other one, which is actually radiation, and Rick the Phoenix experiment, here you see quite clearly the calculation is non trivial, but I won't go into details. It very clearly states that perturbative QCD begins to predict just about for high PT when perturbative QCD is valid, uh, so to speak, with the level transfer is large, whereas for PT less than say about 2.5 or 3 GV, perturbative QCD alone doesn't explain. So if you go and have thermal power perturbative QCD in two sets, two sets of initial temperature, it goes through the data. And that's I think we came as the first hint of photons showing up, throwing light into the formation of quadrant plasma. But that was quite some time ago. <coughs> This is the Phoenix direct photon results who come out again much more nicely. It took about a couple of years, believe it or not. And you can say the see where the thermal plus uh, the perturbative QCD produces the results quite well. Now, this is the latest Alice direct photon at 2.76 TV. It's a beautiful data. And most people think that this data can explain the temperature of the quadrant plasma. Well, we are not interested in the temperature because temperature is a nice idea. Temperature is a nice thermodynamic variable. Temperature we are familiar with. We have some body temperature also. But the fact remains that temperature cannot be measured. All you can measure is Pt and Pt squared to the power half average. And that is a measure of temperature. Here you see the same story even at 2.76 TV. And the point I wish to, wish to mention, I said, which is rather nice, that from SPS to RIC to, to, to LSC, the jump in the energy is orders of magnitude. But the peaking window that shows up the thermal photons is more or less from 1 GV to 3.5 to 4 GV. In fact, the beginning of TGP is really around 1.5 GV or 1 GV approximately without any problem of what the initial energy is, whether it's SPS, whether it's RIC, or LSC, which tends to indicate that the beginning onset of TGP is obviously independent of the initial temperature. However, the LSC is entirely possible that the initial temperature is rather high compared to RIC 
oil spills in particular. Therefore, the time, time duration of the QGB's existence will be much longer. And that is reflected in details because the PG window has the photons are shining go up to 4 GeV as a sort of, not obvious, but you can see that in that particular diagram. And that tends to indicate, indicate that the QGP lifetime is longer in Alice at, 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 um, at um, um, 2.76 TV compared to other objects. Less energy and so on. It just to show that the same diagram of T4 law. And now we go on to the ratio. This is the interesting thing I want to draw your attention. Both are thermometric. In a very new sort of way, I can say that it depends on non interactive system of box, not quite, but more or less, as T4. So look at the ratio of that, it should be independent of space-time evolution, but only depends on some fundamental constants, as you can see here in a very early paper. Of course, life is not that simple anymore. I actually have come in to make it complicated, but the basic idea remains the same. So to show you the ratio it looks like, this is the result mathematically, where Q is GP and mixed phase and so on. This is the ratio IM versus PT of various invariant mass. I mean, this is published already a long some time ago. And as you can see, it tends to get flattened out in a space, but not quite. Not quite. Because flattened out means the QGP is set in. So the ratio RDM tends to go to a plateau beyond 1 GV. The heat is more flat. And that means the quark ground plasma is really form. It appears there is a hint. And as you can see, for certain invented mass window, it becomes quite flat, as it were. And that is understandable if you look at the characteristic of the phase transition and the various species that come into the phase diagram. I mean, phase space, excuse me. And this is what we are just going to, going to be published at uh, LSC is even flatter, and as you can see from 1 GV to 4 GV, it tends to get flatter and flatter, clearly indicating uh, the onset of QGP. I mean, the, 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 the beauty of the ratio is that it tends to cancel out the all kinds of initial parameters that you have to take into account to build the model, like initial temperature, uh, the flow velocity, etc., etc. But if you take the ratio that can cancel out, it's a very simple idea, nothing fantastic, but it works. Sorry? Excuse me? L is the invariant mass of the dielectrons. And that creates a problem because, for example, we don't have, they're massless. So. Uh, but you know, we should take various windows of the uh, dielectrons to see how it goes. To make sure that you are not messing it up, in fact, uh, there was a calculation by one of my young colleagues for the perturbative QCD process and LSC and RIC. And as you can see, both RIC and LSC, the prediction of perturbative QCD of the ratio clearly is not flat or anything like that. So it doesn't really matter so much in terms of that particular result for, through the ratio that we actually find, find out from the experiment. So the observation I won't go into details, except to say that this, this ratio of gamma to mu plus mu minus tends to be larger than LSC compared to RIC, and that's also larger compared to, this is wrong, this is SPS. I'm sorry. And if you are actually calculating in a very simple sort of way, with one approximation, you can get a neat formula which goes as T squared by delta M squared. So as the MRM should be made by foreign large model independent as you go from orders of magnitude of energy from SPS to rectal SC. So now I think I'll go on to something a little more controversial, and that's the application of these ideas uh, to the universe about a microsecond of the Big Bang. Now the point is I'm sure as some people have already talked about, the proton-proton collision 
is about typical times scales in the minus 12 second, where Higgs field begins to become important. And this is about in the minus 6 second. And therefore, the quarks that are there at that point in time, primordial point in time, of course, are mass. Or I can easily argue the answer is no because the chiral symmetry is restored and we haven't hit the phase transition yet of quarks to hadron, and therefore the mass of the quarks may, may be uh, zero or close to zero. But that happens not to be the case because the temperature is very high and it makes the whole thing a little complicated about the nature of the phase transition. Here we see the phase transition diagram once again in full glory. And just to say, for very large mu and high temperature and small temperature is called dense system, which is the area that the fair experiments are going to look into. They are involved with that, because CBM detector compressed bionic matter. But if you go on the left hand side of the diagram, then you have very high temperature, very little chemical potential, something sort of really mimicking. Um, the early universe, so the LSC is really some, somehow, you can say, in the universe, uh, discovery machine, also an idea about how the universe looked like uh, microsecond after the Big Bang. We all know that the ratio of the baryon to gamma, let's say, to S, is about 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 10, and it's a very finely tuned object. So let us get to the calculation. Now, so as I mentioned already, that even in the early universe, probably we cross over. And cross over the genesis in the earlier part of the microsecond of the universe. And this is an area I'm not very particularly familiar with. On the other hand, those who can be called a letter's honcho, using a contemporary word, which I don't particularly like, they think much too much of lattice, forgive me saying. A lattice is usually used for static system. And when there is a system that the universe is expanding in space and time, how far the lattice would be useful or can be used, one has one's doubts. So expanding the universe and a static calculation of lattice cannot be compared with each other that easily. And so therefore to say that even in the universe, there is a crossover definitely and therefore everything will be crossed out it is not a very accurate statement in my opinion. Here we see um, uh, the paper that I was talking about, the Bekel and Belich, if possible to pronounce. This is a standard, sort of, again, phase diagram. A critical endpoint, you can see the crossover. And you can see the arrow there, the standard path of the universe at that time coming from that side and going there to look at matter so far. And once you get there, there's nothing remains to be seen to find out how the whole phase transition took place. And that was the end of thing. This idea, by the way, was first, first out of phase transition, sorry, idea was first initiated by Ed Whitten in 1984. This was the starting of the whole, whole field. The biogenesis is something we will take care of, and electrogenesis to topological spherical transition, electric transition temperature, and this, 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 this German colleagues of mine have looked into it, and it turns out that it's very volatile business, and almost so fine-tuning that probably unphysical. But if you introduce little inflation of about 70 folding at a lower temperature, which may be identified with the QCD phase transition, then it becomes fast forward. You see that in a minute. And there are these people, quote, which I must confess, I have not understood very much the athletic band mechanism of understanding the baryon asymmetry, and that doesn't require super high temperatures, and no less produces whatever is observed at that time of the universe. The delayed phase transition then releases the latent heat and produces at the same time a large interval density which reduces the baryon asymmetry to currently observable value. This is uh, 
ethnic dynamism of some time ago, DQL S quarks and S leptons in the supersymmetric framework. But this is also beginning to question the role of the not entirely because supersymmetry is the root precursor of supersymmetry even after the Higgs boson or something like Higgs boson has been discovered. Or Higgs boson like something discovered. So these are uh, somewhat question mark. But this is achieved through the Van Alvin mechanism, little inflation of a seven unfolding. And that's what happens. I go through it fast. Here we are. So that brings the phase transition point, as you can see, from here, as it was before, to here, which is the regime of first order phase transition. And 70 inflation of these German colleagues is actually published now, by the way, not archived anymore. Supercooling little inflation, and it goes to first order phase transition. Uh, quite nicely. And if there is first order phase transition with this particular scenario, which of course can be debated, then what you can see is the question. So, survivability of cosmological quark nuggets, chromometric plus two fission model, that is, you see in a minute, and that was first proposed by Ed Whitten, as I say, in 1984, and my not so young colleague, Pijus Bhattacharya. Uh, decided uh, with us, uh, we, we decided to, with Pijus to develop this idea in, way back in 1993 and inquired the question about the universe saga at that time. And then we uh, see MB by absorption equal to this essentially with evaporation. And those who are in fashion that we immediately recognize that that particular formula, which is very simple and uh, intuitively applicable is nothing but the Sahai equation of thermal ionization for which you got tremendous credit all over the world. So this comes out naturally from the calculation. And that was in 93. And this is a nice picture of Big Bang. The first order of first transition, the quark nuggets of bulbs, let's call it nuggets, would coexist with the hot hydronic lava for some time. And slowly the quark nuggets would give out. Evaporation starts taking place with preferable neutrons, and then eventually the universe starts creating the universe. This is the picture of Britain, low temperature hydraulic matter, bubbles coming up, and high temperature quark. And then eventually they come together, and slowly the whole universe is taken over by high temperature by the hydrons and the quark nuggets more or less evaporate. But Peugeot and us decided to look into the problem of under what conditions, if any, it is, does not even evaporate. And it turned out there is a number of work done already, <coughs> done even much sooner, back in 1983, and the Japanese group in 1990, chrome electric flux tube model, and we wanted to ask quark nuggets with barrier number MB at the time T, obviously will stop evaporating further the survive if the time scale of evaporation is that. While well, it's much larger than the evaporation time scale, it's much larger than the Hubble expansion, time of cooling time scale, and thus it will survive the whole evolution of the universe. You see, a simple uh, uh, calculation, which not, not so simple actually. It turns out that the dynamic number inside the quark nuggets is really above a sort of uh, 43 or something, 0.25. It does not uh, evaporate. As is more clear in this picture, particularly this picture, here you see temperature dropping as you go and then it becomes flat, which means the dynamic number in the quark nuggets don't change with time. And those quark nuggets will not evaporate, uh, will not evaporate out as it were, and this was the calculation done, and that is all is accepted now, but it flowed around in the universe. Why are these objects is the question. 
So court never should bury one of them there about that stable and survive forever. That's a fantastic statement, and obviously not everybody is going to buy that that easily. But there comes a new discovery of massive astrophysically compact halo objects. And in fact, uh, Charles Alcock, our friend, he discovered that these massive objects between here and large mesonomic clouds by gravitational lensing method. And he got a fair amount of accolade. So in that paper, the Monthly Notice to Royal Astronomical Society in 2002, we established that these quark nuggets who are surviving the evolution of the universe could easily be candidates of machos. And 13 gravitational lensing, mass from 0.15 to 0.95 the solar mass, and most probably is 0.5 solar mass. Alcock discovered that in three mountains with a telescope in 2000, and some other people also did that. Above the threshold for nuclear fusion, so there will be strange quark nuggets, because strange matter is the so no stable matter as we understand. And so the, it could be easily at least a portion of some kind of cold dark matter, but I wouldn't, wouldn't like to say exactly how much it would be in terms of percentage. Maximum 0.3% or something like that. Not zero, but 30% or something like that. That's also published. I will leave the orphan quarks alone because this is the talk I heard where the charged fractionally charged particle has not been observed. So I presume the orphan quarks have discovered their parents. So I skip that. So the Becker and Shaft now, with the new information, they want to find out some so called relics of that. So they talk about primordial density fluctuation, dark matter mass scale, series of present galactic and extragalactic magnetic fields, gravitational wave, nucleation. I won't go into it. This is uh, in terms of a certain exciting developments in this field for gravitational waves and so on, but it's very speculative. And you can look at the archival for <laughs> detail understanding. <clears throat> Finally, I would like to end now uh, to say that Big Bang and Big Bang are obviously not the same, quite clearly. For Big Bang and Big Bang, there's other things like turbulence, inflation, <coughs> gravitation, and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, the universe is an interesting laboratory where everything is happening very slowly. Typical time scale is 10 to minus 5 seconds, whereas for nucleus, nucleus collision, as it is happening in LSC, it's going to be minus 20 seconds, it's much shorter. So any model which depends heavily on equilibration in the universe is a bigger, labor bigger laboratory <coughs> than, than laboratory experiments at LSC, for example. So Big Bang expands against the pull of gravity, and then you can compare with the bag constant but both very violent. And entropy is mysterious, they produce at some stage we don't really know. But both the cases is having like expansion up to a point. In case of so called heavy iron, it's a tensor. Equation of state is decided by gravity, dark matter, even dark energy. And the universe case, of course, is near zero cosmological constant. And we know very little about the fluctuation in the case of iron ion collision. But on the other hand, the universe, the fluctuation in temperature, cosmic background radiation temperature, quite a lot has been discovered. And as we like to know, there was a lot of work in quark brain tests want to be done in terms of fluctuation uh, at the very beginning. Here you see delta T by T is in minus 5, and we don't know much about QGP fluctuations of the radiation have not been measured in inclusive experiments so far. So I promised to end early, which I have done, and I think uh, I wanted to give you a flavor of this field of 
if we have, which is may not be as fundamental as uh, proton proton collision, but yet it sheds some light about the beginning of the universe in a way which you never expected before. And also the challenges of developing new kind of detectors in the large scale collaboration has made our country uh, somewhat visible and enviable, frankly, external and weak. So in that, with actually one important discovery in recent times, which fascinates me because I don't know the answer. So I leave the audience with that peculiar property <coughs> of something which ABS safety, the nature of the race, it has a sheer, uh, sheer viscosity, pi entropy, is about one by four pi. And this is the constant sum instead of KSS bound in uh, anti deceiver conforming field theory. And that also is the case for RIC, for instance. The flow in RIC, relativistic Helian Collider, in fact gives a result of eta by S equal to 1 by 4 pi. So it's a strongly interacting quadrant plasma, not weakly interacting, as you should say, like a gas. It's a perfect fluid. Recently, it was found in graphene, who got the Nobel Prize. And people are trying to wonder what is the result should be a neutron star quark core, which is a quark core. Ultra cold quantum vision is strongly interacting Fermi gas. This is also a solid state physics experiment. Eta bias becomes close to 1 by 4 pi. A microsecond universe <coughs> and QGB in RIC also gives eta bias 1 by 4 pi. Even some of my colleagues and friends have found out the finite nuclei. The standard nuclear physics giant resonances also gives eta by s by 4 pi. So the question that I want to draw is this universality of eta by s among the various diverse areas. And in that particular diagram or picture, the diversity is pretty obvious. What is the fundamental sign that is going on, physics is going on, to have this result universally valid is the question that we are bothering about ourselves now. To end, I'll quote Lewis Carroll, this time the looking glass at Alice in Quarkland, the time has come, the world was said, to talk about many things, of shoes and ships, and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is burning hot, and whether pigs are wings. Thank you. I miss the time scale in the, in the early universe part when there is a phase transition and the time scale in the heavy ion where they speculated a phase transition or they, how are they compared and then the temperature also. Temperature is all the same. Uh, that's why the um, idea of microsecond universe has a temperature that is generated when two ions collide. And that's the most redeeming feature of the present day scenario. Let's say we are quibbling too much about 160 MV. And that's about, just for the heck of it, because two moves, that tells you about five times the temperature in the middle of the sun, or one tenth of a million times. So LSC is an extraordinary machine, but it is the coldest environment, it's coldest in the sense cooler than the background radiation. At the same time, it's the hottest because of the temperature raise in two ion collisions, so to speak. Okay. So, well, it, 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 uh, the LSC collision of two nuclei are really, in that way, mimicking the universe to some extent, um, microsecond after Big Bang. But of course, temperature is uh, going down very fast in the universe. In this case, it's not so. That's a different issue. Okay, I think the lunch is waiting. <laughs> <laughs>